Welcome back to another episode of Good Monsters. If you'd like to support the podcast, please consider following on Instagram, subscribing to YouTube, and following on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, as well as giving a review. In this episode, I am joined by Richard Long from the channel The Christian Apologist. We talk about problems in the church and how to fix them. Hope you enjoy. Let's get right into the episode. Doctorates in Divinity from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. I have uh, many certificates. Some from um, Biola. Some are from Southern Baptist. But I've been doing apologetics for going on about two years now. Been a strong Christian, probably going on of close to ten years now. And I am joined here today with with sorry. me, Cody Lawrence. Uh, I am the host of the Good Monsters podcast and. I um, it's a, a relatively new podcast. I I was I was turned on to the idea of um, starting my podcast after a few negative church experiences, and I was trying to wrestle with that and the idea that um, I I know Christians can do bad things, and all of us do, but it seemed to me that the church in general had a problem, and that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. But through that realization, I started hearing a lot of other people say the same things. And through that journey, uh, up until now, I've just become stronger and stronger in the idea that uh, Christians need better teaching. They need more people boosting them up to help them follow the word better. Uh, They need better education. And all of these things, honestly, are things that the church should be doing. And I think in a lot of ways, many churches, not all churches, but maybe more than you'd think, I think, are failing. And it's something that I'm trying to call out. I believe the same. I believe that uh, a lot of churches, especially in today's society, needs to be talking about apologetics. And it's not just because I'm an apologetics, but so many people... They believe in God, but they believe in God because it's either a a personal uh, relationship they had or uh, something that they encountered that brought them to God, or maybe they were just raised up in the Christian home. But when it comes down to it, they really don't have any evidence on to why they believe God actually is God. Jesus is actually Jesus. And that is why so many people fall away from the Christian faith, especially these young kids when they get off into college. And now even in high school, because they do not teach um, biblical anything anymore. And so they really need to understand that when teachers come at them with science, how they can correlate that science with Christianity and say, well, this is how God came. You know, this is how we know God exists. This is how we know Jesus rose from the dead and vice versa. So that way, you know, these teachers just don't bombard them with, well, it's evolution and this is what you have to believe and it's the only thing that science has to prove, which anybody who's anybody knows that science always has more than one evidence to show them. Just scientists and teachers only want to talk about one thing, and that's just to fulfill their own needs. I think one of the main reasons for this, I agree with you. I think one of the main reasons is that we have allowed evil to or, or complacency, which, which is evil in Christianity, <laughs> to yeah. bleed into the church. And we're welcoming it in with open arms. And we're waving our welcome signs and say, come on in. And we're offering it coffee uh, right into our churches. These horrible yeah. ideas that, um, that are making Christians weak towards uh, challenges in the world. Like I used to be a youth pastor and one of my missions as a youth pastor was to inoculate the students to the things they're going to hear. So like, uh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't raise up your, your student or 
even as an adult, you shouldn't separate yourself from uh, like atheism, for example, like ah, atheism, whatever, who cares about that? No, we need to educate ourselves about atheism. And, but in addition to that, and I think more importantly, and one reason that the church I think has seriously failed is because not only are we not educating uh, each other about the, the challenges against Christianity, but we're not even educating ourselves about Christianity itself well anymore yeah. because most churches, well, I, I can't say most churches, but many, many churches, I would say don't even teach the word. They might pull up a verse and then spend the rest of the time talking about their opinion, the whole rest of the, of the sermon. Yeah. And they play worship music from Hillsong and Elevate. And it's got this weird sexual imagery in it and like dancing with Jesus and um, uh, removing theology from the, the program entirely. Yeah. And I think it's because churches want attendance more than they want the truth because the truth is offensive. And if people are offended, then they'll leave. And we don't want that because we want people to tithe. Exactly. They want people to tithe them, not just for the church itself, but who else benefits from the tithing? The preachers, the preachers get more money. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah, they, they just want to preach a watered down um, version of the gospel. And it's almost as if they want to protect God. Have you ever noticed that? It's like they want to protect God. It's like they don't want to sit there and mention God's wrath because, oh, that makes him a horrible, horrible God. Let's just talk about all the mm. good things God has. Let's protect him because if we tell people about the wrath, they'll be scared to come to him. And it's like, no, it you need be. to tell people about God's wrath. I mean, you need to let them know. I've noticed that every single prophet from the beginning of the Bible to Jesus himself, they preached on two things. Blessings if you follow Christ, curses if you don't. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. That's a central. We, yeah, and like nowadays, they just tend to want to stick to all the blessings, but they don't want to mention what happens if you don't follow Christ, what, you, what happens if you don't follow God. Yeah, and I yeah I've noticed like, go ahead. a central message in, uh, in, in the prophets that I've seen too is repentance, and that's not a word we hear in church often. I just went to a church recently and I heard the pastor say like, Jesus loves you just the way you are. And that, that's like sort of true, but yeah. he also wants you not to be just the way you are. He wants you to be like him. And exactly. it's a, it's a problem if we're teaching our people, our congregations or people who are, or who believe that they're Christians, they might not be, uh, that, you know, God loves you just the way you are. You don't need to change, which is what repentance is. And on top of that, I think when we leave talking about the, the properties and the attributes of God that scare us, like what you were talking about out mm -hmm. of the sermons, we're taking away even from God's goodness because God can't truly be good if he does not seek wrath against evil. Exactly. If he doesn't punish evil, then he's not really that good. And so not only are, uh, are many churches watering down God's um, wrath and, and, you know, the, the parts of the, of God that we don't like, right. but they're in doing that, they're watering down the parts of God that, that make him good in the first place. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I do believe that a lot of preachers, and it's not just preachers, it's Christians as well, but preachers do it a lot is that they will use these good fill scriptures to make people feel better. But me and my wife actually just had this conversation today because she had her Bible study today and they were talking about stuff like this. And I was telling her about, I believe that these lot of good fill scriptures should not be said in the context that they're using them because it can actually pull people away from God than other than pull them closer to him. And what I mean by that is, for instance, if my mother, I'll just use her. I don't want to use somebody else's. <laughs> if my mother was dying of cancer and I'm not a believer, let's just assume. And all these Christians came up to me and said, well, the scripture says that if two or more are gathered and pray for this, and we do not doubt it will be given to us in God's name. And I'm like, heck yeah, let's do this. So then we pray for this. And then my mother dies of cancer anyway. 
Now, I am either going to think that one of you is a hypocrite and you doubt it, and that's why my mother died, or God doesn't exist and my mother died. So I like to tell people that when you're using these good filled scriptures like that, you always need to add at the end of that, but let God's will be done. Because in either way it swings, it was God's will. And so therefore, you're not pushing people away from God. And then if something, a miracle does happen, then God does get the praise, but God's not going to get the cursing. As, and I'm not saying people won't be like, you know, God, why did you take my mother or whatever? But you did say, let God's will be done. And I think a lot of people take scriptures out of content that were used at a specific time in a specific place for specific people. Mm -hmm. And they try to use it in everyday life. And it does make people feel good, but always remember, let your will be done. And that's why I always refer to people, follow the Lord's prayer. He never says anything in the Lord's prayer. The way Jesus told us to pray was, you know, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's why I always tell people like, don't, you know, a lot of these good feel verses can actually push people away from Christ and you don't want to do that. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Uh, I think, like you said, taking verses out of context is also a big problem. Um, we, we need to be sure that we're interpreting the Bible properly. And a problem that I've noticed is, like I said, pastors will often like take a verse and they'll, they'll spend the whole, the whole time talking about their opinion about that. Um, one of the issues with that is when we take verses out of context, it's not God's word anymore. Like if we say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we're like, oh, we can jump off a building because God says so. Well, God didn't actually say that. And so that's, that's not God's word when we're using it in such a way that God didn't actually mean. Yeah, and so, yeah, I'd say absolutely taking verses out of context uh, can take people away from God. Yeah, for sure. I absolutely agree. So for Good. you, what do you think about the sermons that are actually being preached in most Christian churches today and where are they going wrong? Yeah, I think that's that's a good question. And I can't say um, even most churches necessarily, but many of the churches I've been to, probably even over half. Uh, and, and I assume that this probably applies to other churches parts of the country and other parts of the world as well. But in so far that I have experienced, many churches have an issue of preaching uh, and, and preaching either vaguely or incorrect stuff uh, to the congregation. And the reason that that's bad is it over the course of weeks, you know, most people, I'd say most people who go to church, they don't read their Bible. They don't, they don't seek out discipleship on their own. And so the primary way they are getting teaching is on Sundays. And so if the teaching on Sundays is weak, then we are making weak Christians, which I think is exactly what's happening. So mm -hmm. the failing I think that's happening with sermons is uh, probably a couple of different things. I think what I've noticed recently is many pastors preach vague sermons. And uh, I would recommend your listeners try to notice this if this happens at their church. I will hear pastors, uh, one, I think many don't even talk about current events. And and I think you, you could make the argument, which I disagree with, it's like, well, you shouldn't, you should leave politics out of out of uh, church because those are two different things. Uh, but I would say, look, here here's an example. The church I went to the the Sunday after the election, you know, we, we heard that Joe Biden won. And regardless of what side of the political spectrum anybody is on in the church, let's just assume that the church was split 50-50, 50% for Trump, 50% for Biden. And so half of the congregation is worried and they're concerned and they're like, the guy that I wanted in office, it doesn't look like he's going to win. And then the other ones, they're feeling pretty good, but they're also kind of scared too. And they're like, oh, the, who knows what these guys are going to do and whatever. So there's there's a lot of discomfort and there's worry uh, seeping through the entire congregation. And the pastor at this church that I attended, he didn't mention the election at all. Oh, he wow. could have said, he could have said something as simple as, 
look, regardless of what's happening in the country today, God is in control. That's all he could have said, which I think is probably a little too weak in itself. Like he, he sh a pastor should say more and offer more comfort and more biblical advice about current events. But he didn't say anything. And I think I have a theory as to exactly why he didn't say anything. And that's because he would offend people, you know, no matter what you would exactly. say, you might offend people and they would leave if you even pretend to take a political stance on something and pastors don't do that. And that's just one example. But I think, you know, pastors often will not talk about things like homosexuality, which is clearly, obviously uh, not a, not an okay thing in God's eyes. Right. <laughs> and pastors will avoid the subject altogether. They'll avoid the subject of abortion. Um, they'll avoid the subject of not, not only homosexuality, but like same sex marriage and many of the other things that are central issues, uh, that happen to also be political, but it's not like, I think nowadays politics is spiritual by definition because so many central beliefs and values in politics happen to also be central values in Christianity. So if, if one side of the, and, and I don't know if you agree or disagree and uh, it doesn't really matter, but if, if one side of the political spectrum, for example, believes that um, murdering, hypothetically, murdering thousands of unborn babies a year is a totally okay thing to do, and the other position says that that's not an okay thing to do, then probably a Christian would lean towards the, the one that follows exactly. the Ten Commandments that murder is not okay. Yeah. No, um, I'll be the first to say it. Um, I, I, was, I'm a, I was a Trump supporter. I did vote for Trump. I'll be the first to say it. Um, and like I tell people all the time, do I look to Trump as being Jesus, as being perfect? No, I, absolutely not. Um, did I agree with the way he said a lot of things? Absolutely not. But like I tell people all the time, and this is just my opinion, and I've said it on my YouTube videos, and, and I think I even mentioned it on one of my podcasts one time, but I'll say it again. You cannot, to me, there's no possible way you can claim to be a Christian and vote for someone who is totally okay with killing innocent babies. There's just no way. I mean, I don't care if the other guy has the most horrible plan in the world, but he's like, <laughs> I am not okay with killing babies and you know let's say for instance biden had the best i mean let's say he was just top notch everything he said was top notch would make america great let's just say it was but he was like but i'm for abortion yeah i can't vote for you because to me if you are okay with killing innocent children there's something wrong with you mentally and i do not want something wrong mentally with my president so no i'm not well, going to vote for you I think that's what we got anyway. <laughs> I do. I mean, we ended up with it anyway, but like, this is what I tell people now. Cause like, yeah. I'm very outspoken about stuff like that, especially on my podcast and my YouTube videos, mm. but I tell people, they're like, you know, a lot of people are like, well, what do you think now? Well, nothing. Now we deal with it and we pray that Biden does the best job he can do. I yeah. don't want him to fail. You know, mm. I want him to do a great job. Do I think he will? No, I don't. But I will pray that, you know, God will do something in this man's life or Kamala Harris's life that mm -hmm. they will start to change things. And if not, let God's will be done. I mean, it's going to yeah. happen. Regardless. That's good. I think another problem that especially Christians on the right uh, can have is, well, uh, probably both sides, but a lot of what we've seen recently in, in um, like during the the protest at the Capitol and stuff is people waving their flags and, and worshiping Trump like an idol. And that's not okay either. No, uh, no. We have to understand that God appoints our, our leaders and God sets, give, gives our leaders authority as appointed by him. Uh, and we need to submit in, in whatever way that that looks like that we should submit uh, biblically, which I've talked about in my podcast. And, uh, and that's an interesting discussion that we can get to another day because we're going on a tangent now. But yeah, I think um, there are, there's definitely idol worship happening on both sides. And it's not just a left thing. It's definitely on the right too. But um, 
politics, I think, is a huge deal, and it's something that is lacking in churches. And another argument is, well, like a church can't um, can't like endorse a certain political party or they'll lose their nonprofit status. And, and I think that is just a horrible excuse to say that your pastor is a coward because you can, you, you can say abortion is wrong and you should not support people who believe it's okay and not endorse a political party and you won't lose your nonprofit status. It just means that you're weak and you're afraid of people leaving your church and you don't actually believe that God's in control because I think you're right. People try to protect God in some weird way or, or really they're protecting themselves because I think this all boils down to a, a horrible sense of pride that a lot of it's pastors exactly have. What it is. Yeah. Yeah. Pride is, pride is the demise of everything. So with the, with the way they preach nowadays in churches, how do you see it different from what, you know, the epistles were, how they preached the gospel. How do you think that we should be different now? Where do you think it went wrong altogether? Yeah, that's a good question. I think first it's hard to make that comparison exactly because the epistles and the other letters of the New Testament are not preaching necessarily. I think probably the closest epistle we have to preaching is probably Hebrews um, so that's one that we can compare our, our preaching to, like if we're trying to preach biblically, we can preach like the author of Hebrews preached. But, um, I think, I think what we can learn from not only the new Testament, but the old Testament too, is the, the values that we should be preaching. One, it's important to preach the gospel, obviously, because that's the center of our faith. And I think if you're attending a church that where the gospel isn't preached, or maybe they do like a gospel presentation once a month, you know, like a lot of churches do. I've been to churches like that. Um, we're not really going to talk about Jesus too much, except for once a month. And then we're going to bring people to the altar and have our prayer council, whatever, you know, meet with you and pray with you. And Hey, you're saved. That's wow. ridiculous. <laughs> Jesus needs to be the central focus of, of every message. And I mean, if, if you think, well, we don't want to talk about the gospel too much because then it would get boring. If you truly understand what the gospel is, and if you truly understand, um, or, or if you're seeking to understand and love God more, you will never, ever, ever be bored of hearing that Jesus died to save you because you're a sinner. There's one church that I attended uh, years ago that I heard when, when the the pastoral team were trying to develop the church. They were listing out how many times can we get the gospel to the congregation in our service? And they were thinking like three worship songs and all the three worship songs are going to be gospel centric. And then the, um, the sermon is going to be, is going to tie into the gospel and, and push believing in Jesus. And then the close and each of the prayers and we do communion every week. And so they listed like 12 times that the gospel is preached in every sermon. And then they thought and they said, nah, we need more gospel. <laughs> I love that illustration because I think yeah. um, that is one thing that, that the New Testament authors were clearly intentional about. It's all about Jesus. And it's something that we lack in churches. But I also think, um, like I said, values. We're not teaching values. We're teaching often like opinions or like, Hey, here's how to, it's very like practical. There's a lot less theology, which I think is also why a lot of Christians are stupid and they don't know their theology because what one, like I said, if people, if a Christian show up to church every Sunday and that's the only place where they're getting their teaching and it's not good enough teaching to teach them that they should be also reading the Bible on their own and seeking discipleship and, and, you know, do the things that a Christian ought to be yeah. doing then they don't grow. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think, and this is just my opinion, I think where it defers is everything, <laughs> literally everything. Yes. And I say that because, you know, there's scriptures that say that the shepherd should know his sheep. Mm. Well, mm -hmm. I promise you what, I'm not going to name some of these mega church preachers, but I promise you, you do not know half of those people's names. It's a good I point. promise you that. I uh, have you ever heard of Francis Chan? Yeah, 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 sure. 
I'm, I, I used to be, I, mean, I still am, but I, I used to follow him all the time. And he made a very good point about what church should be after he left his mega church. And I, I'm, I'm with him on this. So basically what he said was, you find someone that is well known in scripture and about 10 to 12 people get together, whether it be at someone's house, at a park, wherever, mm -hmm. y'all pray, y'all decide, let the Lord decide on out of the 12 of y'all, 10 of you, who is going to be the best of the preachers to lead the bunch. And basically, like he was saying, is all week long, everybody read your own book. Read the Bible yourself. Don't yeah. let somebody tell you what the Bible says. Read it for yourself. And then when y'all come together, let's say on Sunday, and y'all get together, y'all can talk about what God spoke to you in the scriptures, each and every individual person. Mm -hmm. So that way, each and every person is, you know, learning from the actual scripture and then you spend the next 30 to 45 minutes going around and you pray for each individual person individually, all of y'all. And I believe that's the way it was meant to be. If I look through the old epistles, if I walk into a church nowadays, I don't see what I see in the epistles. That's not what I see. I'm not saying songs are bad, but I didn't see them just singing all the time. And like you said, sticking to one verse and that was it. I mean, they all got into it when in the old days, in the old epistle days, every single person got into it and they all prayed for one another. It wasn't just one person praying for a whole congregation. They knew each other. And when those per people needed help, they all jumped to go help those people. And like Francis Chan pointed out though, like for him, he was like, everybody stick together for a year at the most. After a year, you all pray again, find out who would not be another good preacher for another group and then that person breaks off mm. and everybody splits and then you gather more people and then now you got two churches going and then you know after a year you split and then you got an, you know more churches going and then you know before you know it i mean 30 day i mean five years would turn into hundreds of individual churches around the world and yeah you can still tithe but then you can all decide what that money goes mm. Because mm -hmm. nowadays, if preachers didn't get paid to do what they do, do you think they would do it? Probably not. Most probably yeah, wouldn't. Most right. would give up. <laughs> most would be like, no, I'm not doing this. And yeah. they would quit because it's, it's not the preaching they're in it for. It's not the spreading of the gospel. They're in it for the money. Yeah, many and people I mean, I, I'm not saying that like, their original goal is just, just to gain. But I think it's like, well, why can't I get paid while preaching? Well, what if you don't get paid? Are you still going to do it? Because, mm. I mean, honestly, I believe that most people would not do it. And so if everybody was tithing in these little bitty groups and they said, okay, well, here's how much money we have after six months. What do y'all want to do with it? Everybody puts on a vote. Let's go give it to a soup kitchen. Let's go give it to, you know, homeless people. Let's go donate Bibles. Let's whatever we want to do with it. But that way, if the money didn't go for the church, and I hate to put that in quotations, but if they didn't put it in for the church, because there's no building to pay for, there'd be no electricity, there's no band members, there's no secretaries, there's no nothing to pay for. You meet mm -hmm. at someone's house or you meet in the park bench. Either way you go, there's no overhead. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know what I think about that. I might need to give it some more thought, but I think in the Bible we see that um, early Christians, many early Christians, they went to synagogues um, or they went into people's houses. And sometimes there were really big crowds. And Jesus also taught really big crowds. He taught thousands of people at, an, at a time, but he focused on the 12. And so I think you're right that we need to have a close group who is um, who we can share community with. Because you're absolutely right that a pastor can't know the name of, you know, 5,000 sheep if you're in a 5,000 member church. But I think, I think that one, that verse is referring to, to Jesus and God as the shepherd who knows the names of all the sheep. But um, us as humans are supposed to, to imitate Christ in being a shepherd or the ones who, uh, those of us who are called to being shepherds. And, you know, I could be wrong about this, but kind of where I've where I'm leaning towards right now, because I've done some thought about this too, is 
I don't like calling many pastors pastors because pastor means shepherd. And there are a lot of church leaders, I'll, I like to call them church leaders, who might be teachers, but they're not pastors. And so I think if we were to have a larger church, I, and like I said, I could be wrong, but this is just something I'm, I'm piecing together. I think a good way to structure it might be have a pastor to shepherd other leaders in the church. And then maybe the head pastor also teaches because um, I, I believe that the, that the Bible says in, um, I think it's in Timothy that overseers or leaders of these gatherings should also be able to teach like uh, shepherd teachers. Mm -hmm. But then maybe other people who aren't shepherds, but they're just teachers can teach larger groups. And yeah, what I see in the Bible is that churches are like families. And even if you don't know all your family members, I don't know all my cousins. And I think that's okay. But we need to treat each other in the church like families regardless. And if somebody else comes in to the family, then we welcome them like a brother or sister. And that's what the church should be like. Yeah. Yeah. And the, only, the main, I guess my main reason for making smaller groups is because of the fellowship. Yeah. Because if I'm going to church today and if I have a church of 500 plus people, let's just say, and honestly, in most churches that's not even a mega church yeah you know that's, that wasn't even considered mega churches right but if i if one of these people called me up out of the blue and said hey i'm brother so-and-so look man i'm running a little low on rent i don't know you from adam buddy like i have no clue who you are hmm. you know i don't even know if you really go to our church there's no way for me to prove it i mean i don't know so i mean you know i'd be a little bit more reluctant to help the guy because I don't know, are you a fraud? Are you lying? I don't know. And so with the smaller churches, with the, you know, the smaller groups, I just think that everyone can know everybody. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says that we should pray for everybody in our church individually. And, and like I said, I go back to the mega, you know, churches, like, um, I won't mention names. I was about to, I almost did, but I, I just don't, don't see him saying, well, you know, um, Stephen Furtick, T.D. Jakes, you know, a lot of these big guys, I mean, I'm, I'm not doubting what they are doing. If they're bringing people to Christ, more power to you. If but they're bringing people to Christ. If they're bringing people to Christ. See, that's a big misunderstanding, too, is a, a lot of these preachers think because someone comes to their church and says, oh, I will follow Christ now. And because they say it with their mind, they're like, oh, that's a notch on my belt. And I'm like, no, to follow Christ is with your heart. It's not with your mind. So you might have just got a false conversion and you don't even realize it, you know. Yeah. But, you know, there's no way these people can sit there and put their hand on every single one of those in their congregation and pray for them separately. There's not. There's not enough time in the day. They wouldn't be able to do it. And so I just don't understand why people would want to take something where they can't do it. That's I'm not saying that's bad, but you can't, there's just no way you can pray for 5,000 people every Sunday individually. You're not going to be able to do it. Mm. So why not make this group smaller? So that way everybody can put their hands on that one person in your church group and pray for that person. I just think that it would be more heartfelt. I think it would be more sincere and also, if something happens to that person, like for if me and you are in a church group together and you called me up and said, hey, I need this. Hey, man, if I ain't got it, let me call the other members. We'll figure this out. We'll use the church money, whatever we can. We got you, you know, and that's not going to happen today. If I mean, if I was a, a, a constant member of T.D. Jake's church, for instance, if I was one of his members all the time or Stephen Furtick's and I called them up and said, look. You know, I've never asked the church for anything, but I'm having a rough time this month. I really don't think that they're going to take away out of the church money to give it to me. I don't. They might. I don't know. It depends on the church. As being on a, the pastoral staff at at the church where I was a youth pastor, I, I had conversations often where there would be people who call in and... Um, well, uh, many of them who called in, they weren't church members. And so I think that's probably up to the church if they want to be um, 
if they want to be charitable or not. And, you know, churches give money to, to, to charities and stuff anyway, but like there would be people who would call in and it was obviously a scam. And then those people you turn away, but yeah, often also there were church members who would ask for things. And I, it, I think it was a very unhealthy church, but I did appreciate that people were rarely turned away for those kinds of needs. Like even, let's say, even if they asked for a thousand bucks, the church would help them somehow. Either they would put them in touch with somebody or maybe they would give them 500 instead of a thousand dollars. I don't know. But yeah, I think that's one of the church's responsibilities is to help people in need. And I was just having this conversation with my wife the other day where she was in a small group in a church and, um, and in general, you know, imagine this happening. Somebody in the small group says, I need, I need help to pay rent this month or something. And it's, I don't think it's necessarily the person in that small group's job to, uh, to help that person. If, if maybe they're already donating to the church, because that's the church's job. Now it's your job as a part of the church, but um, if if you feel like you can help them and you have the resources, then you should think about it for sure. But um, I, I see what you're saying. How in a smaller group it would be easier to uh, to understand everybody's needs better. But I think a lot of churches, a lot of bigger churches, like I'm not I'm not against large churches. I just think that. Um, many churches, regardless of size, has have problems. But I see, I see the benefit in having a large church, and I think small groups, like what you're saying, is absolutely necessary because we need community, and we can have better community with fewer people. Because you're right, you can't build a, a personal relationship with five thousand people or even five hundred people. <laughs> exactly. So I think small groups are necessary, but also I see a value in having a larger church where. The larger church has more resources to help individuals, and and the 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 body of Christ, when we all are reunited one day, is going to be billions and billions and billions of people, and so that is the church. The church right. is worldwide, and it's universal, and we are just as a, a brother and sister of Christ as someone in in uh, Japan. So what do you think about people? Because I know a lot of people that go to churches, you know, that they don't like the church they're in um, for whatever reason. And there's not a whole lot of other churches in their area to uh, get any better. So what is your suggestion that they should do to be able to, you know, attend a church, but yet be able to attend a church that's going to preach the, the right things and, and preach the gospel the way it was meant to and not water it down and not take advantage of certain things in certain situations. But yeah, that's a tough one. I think it's, it's hard to, to tell how a church functions in a lot of ways, uh, unless you're more deeply involved. Like, I don't know how my church spends money, you know, for example, but, um, I can determine pretty quickly if they preach the gospel or not. So I think one of the very first things that people need to determine is, is the preaching good? And do you feel welcomed as a member of their community? Because I think churches accomplish probably two primary goals for an individual and its community and its teaching. And, and obviously there's a lot more than that, but I think if you're looking for a church you should look for teaching and also community. Now, if the community isn't there, but the teaching is good, that might be a problem because you can't find good community anywhere. But I think you can find good teaching a little easier, not necessarily in person, but we have the blessing of being able to go online and hear great teachers. And so I think... It, let's say, you know, the pastor at your church is kind of boring, but you have a lot of friends there. I think it's maybe worth still going to the church. However, if you're going to a church where the pastor is openly preaching anti-biblical things, uh, or maybe they're being, and, and, and honestly, I would include 
vague sermons and they're not really wanting to offend people, that would honestly make me consider leaving a church. And I had to make that consideration um, multiple times. You know, like right now I'm looking for a church. I recently moved to where I live and I'm going around looking for a new church. And I have to make the decision between a church where the teaching is very, very weak, but the church is larger and it's easier to find community there <laughs> or a church where the teaching is very, very strong. And I'm lucky enough to have found one of those churches, but the community's weak. So that's honestly a tough decision. And I would say that um, if you can go to a church and you can serve and you can be a part of a community and you can experience at least biblical teaching, it doesn't have to be interesting. It doesn't have, he doesn't have to be the best orator in the world, but I think those are the important things. And if we don't get good teaching, we can find it online. Yeah, me and my wife, we, we, uh, we live in a little bitty town outside of a bigger town. And so we, we've looked for, not, and I've lived in the bigger town most of my life, other than in the military. And, we, you know, she's from the smaller town right outside of my town. And there's really not a church in this town that's worth really going to at all. Sure. So we mainly do um, online church. We'll do online church together. And then she does, me and her do Bible studies together on Mondays and like uh, Wednesdays. And then she has, she holds a Bible study uh, on Zoom and other places um, every Sunday, I believe. So, and then of course I do my YouTube and I do my podcasting. So, so we stay involved in different ways, kind of like what you were saying. I think the main thing that people need to understand though, is when it comes to the Bible, something as important as the Bible, everybody is going to defer on many different things. Um, for instance, like me and you, me and you, and I'm sure many people listening, we can, we can defer on what the mark of the beast is going to be or should be or what we're looking for or you know salvation is salvation just believing in christ is it following christ do we have to be baptized with that all together do we have to repent we can defer on many different things i think the main thing is is just stay to the central figure stay to the central mark you know if they're preaching things that you might not agree with but yet their central focus is Jesus Christ and he is the savior and he is the only way to God, stick with them. Because if you don't have much of a choice, well, as long as he's preaching the main spots, the main thing, everything else is just here and there. Like we can all agree or disagree on if the world was created in six days or if it wasn't, that that's not going to save anybody's soul. That's not going to save us when we get to heaven. So why not just stay focused on what matters the most? And that's Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. But for me, that's just, that's the main thing. It's just staying focused. If they're not staying focused and if you have other choices, I'd hop ship. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I'd agree that Jesus should be the central focus. Um, but I think sometimes in some cases, a, some other things need to come along with that. And maybe I would be a little more strict uh, on this than you would. But like, I think repentance, if we're not teaching repentance in church, get out seriously, because oh, yeah. if, if you look at every single prophet in the Bible and John the Baptist and Jesus Christ and every single one of the disciples, repentance is a central issue. I think we cannot be saved unless we repent. And I don't think that detracts from faith alone because I think to have an authentic faith means like in James, it says that our works will reflect our inner faith, paraphrased. And for our works to reflect our inner faith, um, like if we have faith, we will do works in other words, but it's not the works that saves us. It's the faith. And in the same way, I think if we, I, I think it just doesn't make sense to have faith and also love sin. You can't do both. Christians will sin and God will forgive us for those sins. But if there is a person who calls themselves a Christian and also thinks sin is totally okay, I would question their salvation. And I think churches need to teach in such a way to where these issues are clear. We can't just teach like, 
Jesus is the son of God and he died to save you from your sins. I right. think if people if people fully understood what that means, then they will be saved. But the problem is most people don't. Like uh, America is full of people who say, yeah, I'm a Christian and I also uh, am a, a raging alcoholic and right. I party all the time and I commit every single one of the Ten Commandments uh, or break every single one of the Ten Commandments every day. I'd be like, ah, probably not a Christian. <laughs> Let's tell you about the true gospel. And I think that's what's lacking because every church talks about Jesus. But the problem is we're not talking about the real Jesus. So well, I, I, I think it, yeah, yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, me and my wife had that conversation not too long ago because we we're talking about certain members of our family. I won't mention names because that will cause a big problem. But that's there's fine. certain members in our family that uh, claim to be Christians. Mm. And Yet you don't see an ounce of Christ like in them at all. And I'm like, no, you can claim to be a Christian all day long. I'm like, but you're not. I'm like, mm -hmm. if you're a Christian, you would repent. And mm -hmm. by repenting, and like you said, will we sin? Of course we're going to sin. But now I'm just going to throw the homosexuality thing out there right now because we've already talked about it. But for instance, if I'm a homosexual and I say I'm a Christian, I cannot be a full-blown Jesus believe in following Christian, because if I was, I would not purposely wake up knowing I'm going to sin that day or go to bed knowing I'm going to sin that day. Yeah. I don't know if I'm going to sin tomorrow and I'm not sitting there looking to commit a sin tomorrow, which I will mm -hmm. sin tomorrow, but it's not like it was premeditated. It wasn't like it was something I was knowingly going to sin about. Sure. So yeah, I, I do completely believe in the repentance but I also believe that churches really need to, like I was saying at the beginning, to get into apologetics and teaching people. And the reason I believe that cold heartedly, it's not because it just tells us that in 1 Peter 3.15, but because of what Jesus said to the disciples of John. See, I mean, everyone has to remember that John was the one that leaped in his mama's womb when Jesus came near, when Mary came near. This is Jesus's cousin. This is the one that baptized Jesus, saw the dove come down, heard God's voice say, this is my son. But yet when Jesus finally started his ministry, John sent disciples saying, are you the Messiah? And Jesus didn't say, have faith or that gum, John, really? You didn't hear God talk to me? You didn't see the dove come down? You, you weren't the one that leaped in the belly? And no, he says, watch this. And he goes and performs a bunch of miracles and he says, Go tell John all this evidence you have seen. Yeah. So, I mean, that right there tells you that you you have to have evidence. Uh, I mean, even John had to have yeah. evidence, and look what John witnessed. So, yeah. for us not even to be able to witness anything closely like that, I mean, I, I think it's really important that they teach, you know, people why God exists. Here's how we know. It's not because I'm telling you to take a leap of faith. I'm showing you why God exists. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that um, we see evidence being used all throughout the Bible. Jesus, I, I think faith and evidence are not opposed. Faith, I think, requires evidence. Hebrews 11.1 1 says faith is the assurance of things that we don't see. And we can't be assured of something if we don't have evidence for it. Exactly. So clearly through the Bible, um, I, I have no idea where this idea came from in Christianity over the past few decades where science and Christianity are totally opposed. But yeah, I don't think that's true. But I think something even more dangerous um, in just the past few years is bleeding into the churches that makes truth not important at all. And that's postmodernism, where people, you know, we might even present to people evidence like, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. There, you know, we have the the... A, a big swath of reasons to believe that Jesus reasonably and evidentially rose from the dead. But to that people, I think um, many people, especially younger people nowadays will say things like, well, it's okay for you to believe that you can believe what you believe and I'll believe what I believe. And truth doesn't even come into the equation. And I think there we need to not only be teaching evidence in churches. I think you're absolutely right, but we need to show people that we value evidence because something has gotten us to the position 
to where the world thinks that we are anti-scientific, you know, dummies who don't think evidence is important and we should blindly believe in things that we don't see. That is not Christianity. That's exactly right. And I tell people all the time, if you look at the world, the United States, let's just stay in the United States. If you look at the United States from the 1940s till now, the 1940s, everybody knew America was Christian. That this whole country was a Christian country. And now it's More than now. <laughs> yeah, now it's not, you know, we're not. And sure. there's more atheists and other religions than there are Christians pretty much in the United States anymore. And not when I say Christians, I mean true Christians. And really the only people to blame for that are the Christians. We're the ones to blame for that. Because yeah. you know, we started seeing all these people with all these different religions and all these this atheist point of views. And we're like, oh, we have no way of arguing with them or knowing anything. So let's just lock down inside of our churches and stay away from the outside world. And let's just stick to ourselves. And then all of a sudden, now we're starting to come out of the church building finally, you know, 50 years later. And we're like, wow, where did all these atheists come from? Well, there was nobody there to tell them any different. There was nobody to yeah. teach them. There was nobody to show them. So, you know, we're the reason. And uh, Frank Turk, I don't know if you know him. I do. But Frank Turek, you know, like he said, the reason we have so much transgenderism and homosexuality and, you know, gay marriages going on is the Christian's fault. Because in our government, we decided to make no fault divorce. Well, that's the mm. stupidest thing in the world. So now we're saying marriage really ain't that important, people. Anybody can get married, but if you don't like it, just get out. It's no big deal. You don't have to be at fault. Nobody's at fault. Just get out of it. And I say the Christians are at fault for that because like you were talking about earlier about Christians and being in the government, if we would have said our two cents in, if we would have put our two cents in, and there might've been Christian people in the panel or in the senators and the Congress back in those days, but they were too scared to speak. I mean, what do you expect to happen now? True. I mean, it, it's not important. It, it's not a big deal anymore. Yeah. I think that's really good. That might be a good spot to end on the idea that, you know, we, we made this happen, you know, the, our world is um, falling farther and farther away from Christ and we could have done something about it. But the good news is I think we still can. If yeah. people like us and people like our listeners who are thoughtful about their faith and they're willing to be courageous and stand up and be offensive and say the things that they need to say that are biblical and true then it, the truth is on our side. And so people are bound, if we do our jobs, to come back around. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Mm. So where, for my listeners, can people catch you at? Tell us about your podcast and where you're at, and, and then I can tell your listeners where to catch me. I am pretty much on any podcast network out there right now. The um, Christian Apologist. The Christian Apologist. Um, I actually encourage people to email me directly. So I tell people, email me directly. If you have mm. questions, if you want to, me to answer a video for you on YouTube or on a podcast, just send me an email. My email is richard at thechristianapologist.org. Um, email me there. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I will put your video out as soon as I can. But yeah, I, I suggest people, I'm on YouTube, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram under the same name, The Christian Apologist. And just tune in. I'm on the podcast every Wednesday. I come out every Wednesday at 8 a.m. Nice. And I am Cody Lawrence. My podcast is Good Monsters. Um, I try to release one maybe once a week. I also release YouTube videos on YouTube, also Good Monsters. Uh, I'm on Instagram at Good Monsters Podcast. Um, and I try to put out a little bit of different content on each thing. Like Instagram, I post a lot of pictures and um biblical stuff on YouTube. I post a lot of other things. And then I'm also on Apple Podcasts and Spotify with just the podcast where this is going to be up on. You got to tell my listeners, where did you get your name? Good monsters. We spoke about this the other day. Yeah. I just want everybody to hear this because a lot of people are not going to understand this. <laughs> Good monsters comes from, uh, I was inspired by an old jars of clay song called Good Monsters. And it was about Christians or good people who don't do the things that they should 
And so they're, they're monsters, but they're good ones, but they still don't do enough. Uh, kind of like us and kind of like Christians in our world right now. And so I think, you know, we're all monsters. We're all sinners. We're all bad people, everyone in the world. But uh, we are supposed to be the good ones. And if we realize that, then we will be able to have more courage and stand up for the truth and um, be better followers of Christ. Mm-hmm.